So, is heavy armor actually heavy in the lore? I'm sure many of you have asked yourselves this question before, especially those that, just like me, are also interested in medieval European fighting techniques and how medieval armor actually worked. And because at this point it is already widely known through the community that the game's mechanics are not part of the lore. Well, at least not necessarily. If you are not familiar with this, then I would recommend watching Imperial Knowledge's video on how the games misrepresent the lore sometimes. The link can be found in the description below. If you're not familiar with this issue, just watch it and then we can continue. Did you do it? Good. As you could clearly see, Bethesda often simplifies the lore into game mechanics that are actually usable, as many things in the lore are simply too complex to be implemented on an open world game. If Bethesda wanted to give special attention to the story, as they always did, naturally some of the mechanics would be simplified if compared to the lore. But do the various armors in Tamriel fall in that category? To answer that question, one would have to read the proper in-game books, but having in mind the sheer amount of books in the Elder Scrolls games, obviously not everyone would be able to find the right ones let alone spot the part of the books that give us clues to this. Well, I believe I did find some books that give us valuable information regarding how armor works in the lore. But before anything, how is armor actually supposed to work? In order to answer this question, we need to take a look at history and see how armor actually worked in real life. Let's take the Middle Ages, the medieval period, as a reference here. The first type of armor used in this period was chainmail, or simply mail. I'm sure almost all of you know what kind of armor this is. Basically rings interlocked together to be worn on various body parts so they can serve as armor. In the beginning of the Middle Ages, it was made in the simple form of a shirt or halberd and did not perfectly fit whoever used it so it concentrated its weight on the wearer's shoulders, what could significantly affect the agility of the wearer. This is why chain mail halberds were almost always used with a belt, as it helped to better distribute the weight of the armor through the body by taking a lot of it from the shoulders of the warrior. However, during the 12th century it had already began to be made to fit specific body parts, what would minimize this issue. Chainmail was almost always used with some form of padding underneath, usually in the form of a gambeson, and it provided great protection against lashing attacks. But against thrusts from warriors using swords and especially spears, or from strikes with an axe, chainmail was not as effective because, while it would prevent the blade from piercing through the wearer's flesh unless said blade was really, really pointy, it would turn a piercing blow into a blunt force one, so essentially the wearer would still feel the blow. Well, better than ending up dead anyway. Over time in Europe, especially in the 14th century, plate armor began to develop, reaching its peak in the 15th century, at the very end of the Middle Ages. It was used even after the Renaissance, but it soon became a waste of money as firearms got common. It began as small plates worn on the knees, shoulders and elbows, but soon evolved into the full plate sets that are usually associated with knights. The idea that medieval knights in full plate armor were slow and cumbersome, that they were unable to mount their horses by themselves and that they would not be able to get up if they fell, could not be further from the truth. Knights in plate armor were actually as fast and agile as they would be without the armor, as even though the set as a whole was pretty heavy, the weight was well distributed through the whole body of the warrior, 
with each part being made to fit its wearer perfectly and put together with leather strips spread through various parts of the armor, also with the limbs being covered by thinner plates than the torso. But make no mistake, as there were ways it could slow you down. The plates made the wearer unable to effectively eliminate the heat generated by his or her body, increasing the chances of overheating and exhaustion. Face covering helmets would easily decrease the knight's intake of oxygen, which is why most helmets had some form of opening so the knight could use it to take a fast breath and then return to the fight. And a recent study has shown that the added weight on the limbs would have made it harder for a knight in full plate armor to walk over long distances than a modern soldier in modern body armor. So despite the fact that plate armor allowed the wearer to be agile, contrary to what many think, the distributed weight on the limbs proved to be a disadvantage of full plate armor when the knights had to travel long distances by foot. Also, full plate armor was far from simple, as it contained lots of parts with lots of different names, as you can see on the screen. During the 15th century there were two main types of plate armor, the German style that was heavily decorated and fluted for both aesthetic and practical reasons and gave more importance to symmetry, and the Italian style that was smooth and usually came with larger plates on the left arm to better protect against blows from foes, since most people are right-handed. It's worth mentioning that the German style usually came with a Sally helmet, as it was more common in Germany, while the Italian style usually came with either the Perbute or the Armored helmets, as these were more common in Italy. Blacksmiths from both Germany and Italy also exported their armor, which means these styles could also be found outside the Holy Roman Empire. And in places like England and France, regional styles with characteristics from both the German and Italian ones could also be found. And between chainmail and plate, we have lamellar, basically small plates trapped together. It provided more protection from thrusts than chainmail, but it did not fit its wearer perfectly like plate armor did, which means the weight was also concentrated on a specific spot, as lamellar is usually divided into many armor parts just like plate armor, and each would concentrate its weight on a specific spot. The cuirass or torso armor would easily concentrate the weight on the shoulders, and the cuisses or thigh armor would easily concentrate the weight on the hips. Lamellar was used in more eastern regions like the Byzantine Empire, the Kievan Rus, and the Novgorod Republic, way before plate armor began to develop in Western Europe. Talking about Western Europe, during the development of plate armor, it ended up having a type of armor that was pretty similar to Lamellar, brigantine armor. Despite the fact that both types of armor were basically small plates strapped together, Brigandine was strapped to the wearer's body through many leather strips, just like plate armor, thus better distributing the weight. Brigandine started as a knightly armor in the 14th century and became an infantry armor in the 15th century. Alright, I have shown you pretty much all the advantages and disadvantages of each of the most used armors in medieval Europe. But what about the Elder Scrolls? What about Tamriel? Did Bethesda have in mind combat realism when they wrote the lore? Did they research about how armor actually worked and how it was done in real life before implementing it into the lore? The answer to these questions is yes, they did. Well, at least when there is no magic involved, obviously. And we can see this in some in-game books. In the book The Armorer's Challenge, which is about the duel that would decide the equipment of the Imperial troops in Black Marsh as they fought a rebellion there, the fight between the two duelists, Berade and Eol, is described in detail. While Eol was covered by plates of silver and ebony and wielding an exquisite Dai Katana with a fire enchantment, Berade wore simple merchandise and wielded a simple wooden shield and a longsword. I'll leave the story as a whole for you to read, but in one of the last paragraphs it is described how Eol used his longsword to stab the weak points on Berade's armor, the joints, which is consistent with how swords were used when fighting heavily armored individuals. This duo is completely consistent with how sword plays performed against plate armor in real life.
In the book History of the Fighters Guild, there's a paragraph that mentions that armor has weak points and also mentions many technical names for different armor parts. In the book Halger's Tale, it is said that Pazaroth sometimes wore suit of heavy mail, what shows that suits of armor that are generally considered light armor in-game can be actually heavy in the lore, depending on how they are made. It also states that Terran, who made a new suit of armor for Pazaroth for reasons you know when you read the book, rubbed Luka dust on the leg joints so they would stick together the more Pazaroth sweated and give him less mobility over time, which indicates that armor suits do allow a great deal of mobility in the lore, and there may be other examples that I don't know of. But there's a book that I saved for last, because it gives us positive proof that heavy armor in the lore may or may not decrease the wearer's agility depending on its design. And it's the book titled How Orsinium Passed to the Orcs, or simply Orsinium and the Orcs depending on the game in which you read it. The book describes the political struggle over the lands between the regions of Menevia and Wayrest in High Rock that would end up being Orsinium as it appeared in The Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall in the end of the Third Era. There were two opposing claims to the land, one from a Breton noble called Bowen and the other from a Norc called Gort Pogro Nagorm, with the latter having appeared in The Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall and in The Elder Scrolls Legends. As the story goes, both Bowen and Gortwog had strong claims to the land and had equal titles to the point of the judge referring to both of them as lords. So the judge just followed the law as he should have and said, quote unquote, if two claimants with equal titles to the property are set in a deadlock, a duel must be held, and allowed Lord Gortwog to choose the weapons and armor for the duelists and Lord Bowen to choose the location for the duel. Lord Gortwog decided the armor would be orcish and the weapons would be common longswords, while Lord Bowen decided the duel would take place in the central courtyard of the palace that belonged to his cousin, Lord Beryuth, in Wayrest. Lord Bowen arrived at his cousin's palace a week before the duel was scheduled and decided he needed to practice. And as the book describes, quote unquote, a suit of orcish armor was purchased, and for the first time in his life, Bowen wore something of tremendous weight and limited facility, and that is the part that is of interest for this video. You see, orcish armor is heavily influenced by medieval Mongolian armor, and the Mongolians had lamellar armor as their most effective armor. Remember what I said about lamellar easily concentrated the weight on the wearer's shoulders, which would significantly decrease the wearer's agility? In case you are wondering about Skyrim's orcish armor, even this version is based on the Mongols to some extent, such as that patch of hair on the helmet and the shape of the boots, despite being evidently more fantasy-like, with most of it resembling the orcish armor from Lord of the Rings. With that said, take a closer look at the shoulders. The various plates that cover the chest, the back and the arms are directly connected to the shoulder plate, and they are not strapped to their respective body parts like real-life plate armor was, and the lower plates also seem to concentrate their weight on the belly and the hips. In other words, even in Skyrim's orcish armor design, the weight is concentrated on the shoulders and the hips, just like in the more Mongol-like orcish armor style from the previous games. With that said, the sentence that reveals Bowen got tired quickly while wearing orcish armor may be a short one, but is of tremendous importance for this video. You see, High Rock society is heavily based on the French and the English societies during the Middle Ages, just like how Skyrim society is heavily based on the Scandinavian society of the early Middle Ages. Breton society, just like the medieval French and English ones that served as an inspiration for it, is feudalistic, and in feudalism, the nobles started to train for battle from a young age, and when achieving the status of knight, they trained for battle in the best suits of armor available at their time. Bowen, as a Breton noble, was certainly used to fighting in full plate sets, but when using an orcish set, he tired quickly. This, without a shadow of a doubt, reveals that the majority of the heavy armor sets would not severely limit the wearer's mobility in the lore, 
and is another example of the tremendous effort that Badesta's writers put into it, going so far as having in mind how arms and armor worked in real life before writing about them in the lore. Well, that's all for this video, folks. If you learned something new, please let me know in the comments below. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed yet, and I'll see you all on the next video. Lok Thum.